This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Today I am joined by culinary historian Michael Twitty, who is going to help me ensure my new year is filled with good luck and prosperity by making a dish called Hoppin' John. So thank you, Michael, for joining thank me you. today as we make Hoppin' John, this time on Tasting History. All right. So before we get started, I wanted to find out what is the connection to this and New Year's. Okay, great. So um, in the South, it's traditional to eat um, field peas, black-eyed peas on New Year's Day. Um, and they represent change, but that's a pun because, you know, most uh, cultures have a New Year's food that has a pun both in name and in practice. So it's change, meaning like change money, because collard greens, which are all traditional dish, are cash. Ah. So they have the change to the, to the cash. But it also represents change as in change of fortune, change of luck, change of opportunity. Um, and that's a really old part of the piece of field peas, black-eyed peas. They are used as a symbol. Now, the paradox is this. The practice is likely European, but the vehicle is African. And for a lot of Southern culture and history, and quite frankly, Latin American history as well, there are these three strands of indigenous, African, and European right. that always come together no matter what you do. So for our purposes, the rice, the black-eyed peas, or field peas as we have them here, and um, the practice of New Year's. Whose New Year's is it? It's the Gregorian calendar New Year's. It's not, it's not a New Year's as known to any of the West African cultures right. from which people came. But it is um, what it is, and it was at a time of year where, for my enslaved ancestors, there was a respite between Christmas Eve and New Year's Day. Hmm. And so it was an opportunity for the enslaved community to come together to celebrate each other. What did Christmas mean to them? What did the holidays mean to them? Well, first and foremost, it meant connecting with your family. Because as enslaved people, the average enslaved person was sold two to three times in their lifetime, mm. which meant that there was an inability to um, connect successfully with your kin. So anytime you have the opportunity to do that and cement those relationships, that was important. So what if I'm talking about Hop and John from the perspective of somebody who lives in the low country, for example, what do I want not to change in the new year? Being separated from my family. Right. So for some people, they're going to be, oh, goodness, we just got... No, when you talk about this history, it goes hand in hand with the social, economic, and cultural realities of the United States and beyond. It's, it's inescapable. But what I love about this is that this dish connects us to our ancestors going back millennia, not just the antebellum south, the colonials, millennia, back into ancient Africa. And it says we survived it says we were always trying to survive and pass in our culture and resist um, a forced acculturation by simply cooking our dishes, feeding to our children, and teaching them the meaning of what they were eating. That's, we used to eat black-eyed peas at New Year's, and it was just for good luck. Right, and that was the end. That was that was all the story I had. So I'm really <laughs> excited to learn. I mean, this has so much more gravitas. I've got chills. Where's just your listening. family from? Uh, well, we live live in Phoenix, but um, my my father's family comes from like Missouri area. So yeah, th you know that's that's yep. the tradition. But we didn't know really other than right. it's good luck. Um, so right. So just even even so far, uh, what you've said is um, wow okay. enlightening, and we're going to get more into all of that. But I first think we need to start with food. Sure. All right. Absolutely. So what do we got here? Okay, so these are red field peas, also known as sapelo field peas from my garden. And there are so many different types of field peas. Now, some, most people know Hop and John or uh, rice and peas as black-eyed peas and rice. However, if you are a true Gullah Geechee, the red field peas are the peas that you use. So these aren't from a company. They're not from Camellia, which is where the great source People want to know where to get the, a good source of like reddish field peas from that are common on the market. Mm -hmm. Camellia is great. But these are heirloom field peas growing in my garden in Virginia. So I, this is not all that I have, but they are prolific 
and they grow well, and they grow well in hot weather. We had a lot of hot weather this year. All right. So what we need to do is, you can see the chafe. Yes. That means they are real and they are honest. So we got to clean these bad boys off and make sure that we get all that chafe off of there. We don't want to eat chafe. Nope. Because your system can't digest, neither can mine. <laughs> so that's the first thing we need to do. Okay. And then we'll soak them to see if they're still alive. You know what I mean by that? The ones that aren't... Um, have a little air in them because they had little buggies or whatever. Ah. Will float. Okay. And the ones that are solid will sink. And those ones, those are the ones we'll cook with. I love that you can see the chafe like in the air when you pour them. Mm -hmm. But these are from um, originally from Georgia, but also by way of West Africa. This is just one of the world's oldest crops. So what we need to do is kind of like figure out a way to do this. We might have to go outside, honestly. <laughs> and do a little tossing okay. in the sieve, okay, and like get it kind of like let the wind carry the chafe away, like okay. like the old way, oh the old days, and we'll figure it out. Then let's do that. All right, cool. So what we're gonna do to finish the process is put it in the water. Yeah? All right. So the chafe will come off real easy in the water. It'll all come to the top. And then you see there are some peas that are floating. That means they're not quite where they should be. So let's I see get rid of that nonsense. All right. So at this point, we need to actually get some hot water going. Okay, let's just take one of those guys. Yes. And Hold it up for the audience. <laughs> yep. What is this? That is what they used to call Negro pepper back in the day, which is one of a number of hot red chilies that Africans could not live without. And if you want, at this stage, we can throw in the other herbs that I brought. Just throw them in whole, and we can retrieve them later. So enslaved people did, ladies and gentlemen, have sage, rosemary, thyme, parsley, basil. These are very common in the enslaved communities of the Chesapeake, the Low Country, and Louisiana. And also, we need to begin to fry up our meat. So, full disclosure, I have a kosher kitchen at home. Right. And this traditionally calls for ham hocks or for bacon. Right. I wanted you to use something closer to the process. Okay. And we know that there were enslaved Africans in the Carolinas, Maryland, other places who were Muslim, even in the 19th century, who refused their rations in pork that got them insulted beef. Which this is Pretty beef. much, yeah. Perfect. Yep. All right. So there what we do we do with this? We're going to fry this up? Yep. And we're going to do that first in the cast iron. Yep. And we're going to let that get nice and brown and crisp. Yeah. All right. I want you to take a pinch of the salt, a small pinch of this red pepper, and a small pinch of the kitchen pepper. So this is kitchen pepper, and it is the cooking gene kitchen pepper. You've got, yes. Michael brought me several different spices that he sells. Barbecue spice. Yes, that is actually redacted from a WPA narrative from a man who was born in slavery, who was a barbecue man during slavery. So he took his ingredients in dry form made into a barbecue rub. Yeah. I can't wait to try this. Yeah. I'll put links down there if you want to try it. Cool. So we're coming very soon to having to take these out, put them on like a piece of paper towel to catch the grease. What we also need to do is we need to chop up two of these onions, rough chop, dump that in there, give it a stir, and then I need the heat that's a little bit higher. Fragrant and translucent and infused with the, with the fat of the meat, okay? And, that's, and that, that, I think, is the smell of that 19th century Southern cooking. Mm -hmm. It's the herbs, it's the spices, it's the hot pepper, it's the bacon fat, it's the onion. And then, and then of course, anything comes with the peppers or whatever you're using, the green peppers or uh, tomatoes or whatever else get, you know, hits your nose as you're walking through it. These are a few of my favorite things. Yep, Those it's are, beautiful. Yeah. Then we're gonna put, we're, we'll almost to the stage where we'll put these guys on, oh yeah. I actually like the fact that the water is in the peas and they smell fragrant. So we're straining the peas, but we are keeping that liquid. Mm -hmm. So let's put the peas on in with the fat. Pick out those um, twigs. And we're going to put a little bit more kitchen pepper. I'll let you do that. People ask me, well, where did the spices come from? Okay, so here we go. Um, purchase, barter, and theft. And mm -hmm. we get things today, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are only three ways. And if you ask an enslaved person, am I actually stealing it? They say no. You know why? Because the pepper is your property. The spice is your property. I'm your property. How, what, a, what a hell of a thing to say. You stole my granddaddy from Africa. Yeah. 
What's it to you? That's, that was an actual argument that an enslaved man made without punishment, I might mention, to the mission of his plantation. Daring him. How dare you? How dare, how dare you steal my grandfather? And amazingly, he doesn't, you know, in that one instance, he does not face, you know, punishment for, for speaking to power. But what a hell of a thing to, to, you know, get recorded and come down through history. So they were like, I'm not stealing. For, if, I'm not, if I can't, I don't have enough to eat. My kids don't have enough to eat. We're not strong enough to work for you. Yeah. And other times, I'll give you a really sad example. One of my ancestors lost some of her children because they were so hungry, they, they went and took the eggs from the guinea fowl to eat. And they got caught. And the little daughter was sold off. That's in my own bloodline. And that's why, for me, the cooking gene was so important because anybody can talk generically about food history. There's another thing when you're talking about the people who you come from. So what we need to do, we're going to need some water to cover those peas. Okay. And give them a soft, gentle boil for another hour. Then we're going to shift to um, rice in this pot. So we need a measuring cup of like maybe a cup and a quarter okay. of rice. I always do a little bit more because of the sacrifice. The rice at the bottom of the a pot. Mm. So while the beans and the rice cook for the next 40, 50 minutes, uh, we're going to learn a little bit about the history of Hop and John. So, what do you want to know? Where does it get its name? That is a really great question. Um, some people have said it comes from a Creole expression. Um, some people, you know, say it's pois à pigeon because um, pigeon peas are important. I think that's nonsense. Um, it's a fine story, though. It's a nice, <laughs> but again, you know, a lot of these stories try to attribute these things to uh, the European mind or ear. <clears throat> and this is clearly not a dish um, that originates anywhere near there. Um, for example, the word "jon," "jon," in Mande, Mandinka, the family of lambs coming out of the Mali Empire, spreading throughout West Africa. That's 21 different languages. Um, John means an enslaved person. Mm. The class of the enslaved, because it's a hierarchical society. It's a caste. So interesting that the, the name John is in there. Because John, to us, is not like English John. Yeah. Right? But you have to be able to look at these words and terms and stories with two to three different ears. I'm not saying it has to be that. But I'm right. saying that awareness of it, the languages of the enslaved is so important. So that's, it's a very confusing, some even attribute the name to, to Malay. I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. This, this, these other origin stories don't gel with who we know came to North America. So when did it become associated with the new year? Did that happen when this dish was still in Africa? Or when it was over here? Um, my best guess is that it's a Celtic belief. Oh. That, yeah. I did not see that and, coming. And it's, and it's not, <laughs> and, there, and there obviously would not have been black eyed peas in Ireland. Right. But it was a Northern European Celtic belief about eating peas in the new year. But for Africans, it's like, okay, we have our own version of that. And this pea is so important to Southern culture that during the Civil War, Robert E. Lee himself, a <laughs> great source of things, you know, called the cow pea, the field pea, the black eyed pea, the savior of the Confederacy. But again, the savior of the Confederacy is the fruit <clears throat> of the enslaved. Right. So who was the real savior there? Thomas Jefferson's favorite vegetable was Crowder peas. Really? Another variety of the field pea. Interesting. So we're talking about like again and again and again, fingers are pointing back to this very complex origin story. That, you know, we have recipe for Hoppin' John in the Carolina Housewife. And of course, the ladies of Charleston take great pride, even though it's really the black woman cooking that food for whom this was an issue of pride. Right. When it's uh, mentioned <clears throat> in the Virginia Housewife, is it called Hoppin' John? So not the Carolina Housewife, yes. Oh, the Carolina Housewife. Yes. Okay. But Virginia Housewife, she does have recipes, however, for black-eyed pea cakes. Okay. Which are literally her own version of Akara. And remember... Uh, Mary Randolph lived in a plantation with a lot of women still fresh from Nigeria living and working and cooking around her. And she was the minority on that plantation in Gooseland County, Virginia. 
<laughs> so I mean, we just it just, I mean, there's a whole alternative keys to an alternative history that lie within these ingredients and these stories. But again, it's it's not it's not I'm not trying to say that you know one group prevails. I'm just saying that the group that we often think of as not having a voice has a larger voice than we know. And that these narratives are all twisted and braided together. And they reveal themselves over time to the discerning scholar. Like you. I hope so. Now, do you talk about either of these, in, or this, in either of your books? He has written several books. Yes, I do. The Cooking Gene and Kosher Soul. This was your first book, for, right? First book winner of two James Beard Awards. Oh, very nice. Uh, second book winner of the first Black American Award of the National Jewish Book Award in its entire history. And... So break down exactly kind of what you cover in these. Right. And then it's also Rice for UNC Press. Hey, UNC Press, I didn't forget about you, Rice. So The Cooking Gene traces my family history from Africa to America, from slavery to freedom. And anybody can just write about food history, culinary history, but, but what if you put yourself under the microscope? What if you apply those rules of scholarship and distance to your own lineage and see how food shaped your family journey. That's what I do in this book. And um, so we have this beautiful family tree going back to the 17 and 1600s. That's a lot of work. Wow. That's thousands of dollars, travel to eight different African countries, archives in three continents. I wanted this to be my culinary version of Alex Haley's roots, but be solidly based in culinary history. And I want to, be to blue, want it to be a blueprint for other people looking for their own family journeys, whether African-American or not. A it's, way to do it. It is a beautiful book. And look at that baby face on the cover. All right. <laughs> That's 10 years ago. It's scary. It's like, dang, that was 10 years ago. Looking good. Um, please support my work. Because you know something? A lot of people say, well, where is this? Where is that example? Where is It's here. We just have to make sure that the voices that are out there get the support that they need. Absolutely. This is hard work. It's also, you know, you've done an excellent job of this. You've made this accessible and fun for a lot of people. Um, and, of course, there are a lot of us out here who are, there's a million and one approaches to this. Mm -hmm. But to get them all out there, we have to really just support people and help them tell their story. All that's in the description, and now I think it's about time to try some Hop and John, right? Yeah, I'm excited. Finally, I've been waiting all day. <laughs> so when you make the put the rice in with the black eyed peas as they cook, it's going to turn that color, maybe even a little bit darker. So um, in a little bit more history, in Louisiana, it was called jambalaya congri. So jambalaya with congri. Congri is black eyed peas. Mm. So that was the Creole version. It wasn't any, hardly any different from this version. The only difference was it may not have contained the same kind of field pea. Because okay. there were 20, 30, 40 varieties all across the colonial land of Bellum South. Right. All of which have their ultimate origin in Africa. So that is one thing to keep in mind as we're enjoying this. There were different versions. But that just shows you how much alike the base of the Creole Louisiana cuisine was like the rest of Southern food. Said a French name. That was about it. Some people are gonna be like, nah, I'm gonna be like, yeah. But it is what it is. So let's dig in. You have a spoon? Let's do it, yeah. Come on, give it up. Okay, cool. We're gonna eat right out of the pot. Right out of the pot, just like our ancestors. Okay. Lahaim. What do you have on? Mmm. How's that? Mmm. That is so flavorful. Mm hmm Now, pinch more salt, but that's me being cautious. Be real. I don't like to over salt because wait wait till it's over. Yeah. And then yeah. Warm, but honestly, you can add a little bit more if you want, but but honestly, it's really good on its own. Yeah. I don't, I, I it's not it's not that it's un under salted, mm -mm. it's just that it's not, you know, it doesn't have like a certain kind of like pop. I think if you get a piece of the bacon with it, it does it. That gives the salt. So mm -hmm. piece of bacon with every bite. And they got the herbs and the spices and the onion. And mm -hmm. nothing is oh, dominating yeah. anything else. Mm. It makes it like it's a whole new flavor. Mm -hmm. um, what's also really interesting is the texture. Because 
you were telling me earlier that the rice needs to kind of break apart. Each, each grain is individual. And that's what it is until it hits your mouth. And then it all kind of like comes together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make something like this for, uh, for New Year's. Is it good luck? Yeah, sure. Yeah. But more so, it's just, it's just delicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining me, for showing me how to make this, for sharing the history of Hop and John, and uh, I look forward to working together again soon. Likewise, that's me. We finally made this happen. Yeah, y'all don't know the pandemic happened. He reached out to me. I was like, "We've been trying uh, years. We've been trying this for years, but yep. this is worth it. Totally worth it. Absolutely." What else I've been trying to do for years is make a website for tasting history. Hope that transition wasn't too jarring. But it's finally here. After nearly a year of transferring recipes from the show to the website, it is finally up. Now it is still very much a work in progress. There are recipes from early days of the show that I haven't got over there yet. So I'm, I'm looking for, for feedback on the look of it, the usability of it, all that kind of stuff. I just wanna make it better. So the website is tastinghistory.com and I made it with help from today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace makes building a website so easy with their dynamic tools like their drag and drop technology for both desktop and for mobile. And they have lots of templates, so while you can customize it however you like, you also have something to work with right off the bat so you're not staring at a blank website. And if you're selling any products on the site, they make it easy to manage orders, track inventory and sales, and help with pretty much every aspect of bookkeeping. So if you're looking to make a website, then go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you are ready to launch, then go to squarespace.com slash tasting history for 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. Have a wonderful, happy new year, and I will see you next time on Tasting History.